First order of business is public comment. Um, any members of the public want to give comment? We're on the uh, virtual. Nope. Um, the next order is the consent agenda. Uh, motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll move that we approve the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a second? Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, Look, we're already ahead of schedule. We're way ahead of schedule. So exciting. Good up, Jim. New board member applicants. We have um, two folks who applied to the board, uh, Lynn Turcott and uh, Scott Lewins. Um, I just want to give some time if if either one of you want to introduce yourself. Uh, and if you're not here, I'm definitely happy to give an overview of your letter. I see Scott. Um, oh, and hey, hey, Lynn, how are you? Good. Um, whoever wants to go first, go ahead and please just go up to the, the seat and introduce yourself for the camera. And uh, um, yeah, um, and again, thanks for to both of you for being interested. It's, uh, Super and super important, and we really appreciate the interest. Well, um, I'm Lynn Turcott, and I'm interested in filling the empty board position. Um, I think you have all of you seen my letter of interest, so you kind of know what my background is. Um, and I guess then what I want you to know besides that is that um, I really believe in community service, and that's why I thought about doing uh, filling this position. I think it's important to be part of the community and be involved in what's going on. I also have a couple of grandkids at the school, a freshman and a junior, and um, they like the school. <laughs> I've heard good things about the school. Um, I'm a retired person, so uh, after taking a year off and doing absolutely nothing other than asking myself what I want to do when I get up in the morning, I'm ready to, I'm finished with that now, <laughs> and I'm ready to get going. Um, I looked at uh, past uh, board meeting minutes and agendas and um, was really interested in the kinds of issues that you're dealing with right now. Um, I think I could uh, contribute to the conversation around those things. I'm, I believe I'm known as a collaborative person. I'm enthusiastic. I sometimes have a good sense of humor. And um, I'm hardworking. And, would be interested in filling the position. Do you have questions for yeah, me? Any questions for Lynn? I have a, I have a couple. Yeah. yeah. Um, what What do you What expectation do you have for amount of time you need to need to fulfill the board, the seat on the board, or the the work the, that it takes? Um, well, I've been on boards before, and it varies from board to board. So, I'm assuming. You know, there'd be several hours a month if I was on a committee or, I mean, I have time on my hands and if I take on a commitment, I follow through on it, so. Great. And then my second one is, you had mentioned in your letter, um, it felt like you were more, of, and this is not, I'm more of a curiosity that I have. Yeah, yeah. Um, you more were offering to fill the vacancy until the election do you would you consider running um, yes I on would town uh, meeting day if yeah yeah I would consider running um, I think it actually it worked out great I was actually thinking of running for the board um, and then I saw the notice on front mm -hmm. porch forum and thought well that would be a really good way to get a sense of what the board's like and um, you know who the players are and whether I would fit in with that particular group of people. Um, and if I, I feel like I could contribute, then I would consider running, definitely. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Hi, all. 
Uh, my name is Scott Lewins. Um, actually, very similar to Lynn, um, uh, other than the fact that I'm not retired and I don't have grandkids. Um, but but I do have kids in the in the district. Um, I have also sat on boards before um, before coming to, to Montpelier. I was in Randolph. I was on the board. Uh, at that point, it was three separate boards: so the high school, the supervisory union, and the tech center. Um, so I've got a little bit of experience um, with boards as well. Um, I have a little bit less free time on my hands, but um, yeah, I'm looking to re-engage with my community a little bit more now that my kids are um, demanding a little bit less time of me. Um, and yeah, I also mentioned in my letter, um, in my so I, I'm an educator with UVM Extension, um, and prior to that, I've been in various classroom um, positions as well as um, some administration. Um, board experience, so I've kind of got a, a sense of the lived experience of a bunch of different folks, and, and I couldn't help but mention that that I was a sub here um, a while back and in the middle school, so um, yeah, kind of have a taste of a lot of the different roles of, of folks in, in a school setting, um, and would love to be able to contribute. Um, yeah, so happy to answer questions or get back to my, um, my kids, because they're by themselves right now. Uh, I'm solo parenting for a little while, so. Uh, questions for Scott? Same question. Curious to know what you what your expectation is for time commitment. Yeah, I mean, roughly. again, having sat on the board in boards in Randolph, um, I I understand that. Well, I guess here it would just be one and not three, so um, divide that by three. But yeah, it depends on what time of year, um, what committees. Um, but yeah, I'm, I understand what the commitment could look like. And then would you consider running mm -hmm. on town meeting day? If yeah, you, yeah, yeah. It's not something that I was dead set on, um, but ever since having, so I had to step down off of the Randolph board once I moved out of the district, um, so it wasn't by choice. Um, and so I've wanted to get back into that type of service, um, and now just seemed like a good time, so. Thank you. Yeah, other questions? Great, thank you. So the, pro the, the process on this, thank you. as we recently learned, is we actually have to make the appointment within 30 days of the resignation, so yeah, <laughs> tonight. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and the SBA. Yes. Um, so we'll go into executive session later. I think it's the last thing on our uh, schedule. You can either stick around. Scott, sounds like you've got yeah. duties to attend to. Um, that's fair. Otherwise, we'll just get in touch with you after we, we meet, but we'll make a decision tonight and I'll reach out and um, thank both of you and let, let you know who, who we, we pick. Um, yeah, and again, uh, you know, if, if we don't pick you, we are, you know, there is an election in the spring, so um, we're always interested in, in candidates for that as well. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Budget presentation. Here we go. Ready, yeah. board members, you ready for uh, budget <laughs> season to begin? Uh, we're ready. I'm ready. So I was telling um, Jill when she came in that I fixed my screen share, everybody. So oh. that's a big plus. Congratulations. Yeah, I know that is a big <laughs> win for me. Um, so last Thursday is the day that I, I always prepare the board packet with Anna on a Thursday and I wrote my superintendent's report stating how it was a really hard budget season and these fine people who are here today, the leadership team, were told at multiple points, yep, we got to get lower, we got to get lower, we got to get lower. Christina and I met multiple times to figure out where we could, what we could look at to get the tax rate down and I went to bed on Thursday with a 6.7% increase in the tax rate with what we knew at the time. And then Friday afternoon after Anna had sent most of the, the packet out to you all, or it was pretty well set to be sent out to you all, Christina received the letter for the dollar yield, which increased by $2,000 okay. from the state. And that significantly changed our budget, <laughs> our budget amount, our tax rate implications just from that one dollar yield amount that we have zero control over. So there's a surplus in the Ed Fund once again. 
Um, so the state's approximate or their thinking, of course, it doesn't get set into law until spring. I'm looking at Christina so she can correct me if I'm wrong in any of this. Um, the budget or the state projection for the dollar yield is to increase it another $2,000, which Christina will talk about later, and that significantly impacts our tax rate. However, we did not change our budget for you, despite the fact that we knew that on Friday, um, because there are still unknowns that have significant impact on our budget, that we should know more on December 15th before the next budget presentation before the school board. So I just want to put that out there first, okay? So we recognize that right now for Montpelier it's an 8% decrease and I believe for Roxbury it's a 10% decrease and that's a big decrease and that's actually beautiful for the time we are in and our taxpayers and um, we had to prioritize quite a bit from the administrative perspective, so we'll be looking at what we may be able to put back in once we know our equalized pupil number, or at least the first draft of the equalized pupil number on December 15th. Okay, okay? so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, all right, so the draft budget, of course this is a draft budget, so the board is gonna see this about four more times, um, and by the, by the time we're done, you'll probably be sick of it and memorized it. But this is where we're going today, the outline of the presentation. We're going to start with some different district information and context. Uh, Christina's going to go into some glossary of terms because education finance in Vermont is not easy to understand. Um, talk about our unknowns, the at a glance, talk about enrollment a little bit our staffing, um, the expenses and revenues, it follows the same format as the board has seen in past years. Um, but we did pretty it up, or Anna, I should say, pretty it up a little bit from Grant's former presentations. So looking at district information, this information is as of November 30th, I believe, for students. Um, and as Rhett pointed out in an email earlier, it is different than the next slide because these are the students that actually are here in our buildings, like so that show up to school at our buildings. Um, whereas this information is from our October 1st count, which is what we need to send into the state. And our equalized pupil is based on our October 1st counts. One of the major reasons for the difference, particularly at RVS and UES, is because uh, RVS and UVS have a pre-K and we get the, the kids who like live in Montpelier who go to a private pre-K and take advantage of Act 166 funding um, still get counted, like will show up on our rolls here for October 1st. So that's one of the major reasons why there's a difference. Um, but just so the, the, the board has some of our demographic information, of course, where it says less than 11, that means that it's just too small of a number to present publicly. Um, and so that number is anywhere from zero to 11. Uh, but that, that's for our free and reduced, people who are eligible for free and reduced that we know of and our multilingual population as well as race, race and ethnicity. Is that 54 students at each school or total between those three schools? Total between the three schools. <laughs> yep, sorry, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. All right. So the themes for our budget this year is we still want to support our theory of growth, of course, while being sensitive to the tax implications to our community. The state factors um, that dollar yield went up $2,000, so it's anticipated. It says anticipated again because it's not written into law until spring, but there's an anticipated $15,479 yield that I've been told that that's due to a surplus in the Ed Fund, and I believe they said 50% was going to be used towards the dollar yield and 50% was going to be used towards educational advancement and priorities of the Agency of Education. The CLA, Common Level of Appraisal, and Equalized Pupils, those are still unknown at, the at this time. Um, equalized Pupils, the first draft of that number should come to us December 15th. It's always the first draft. There are always mistakes with that number every single year. Um, but with the next budget presentation, we'll have a better idea of what our Equalized Pupils in are. For this budget, Christina just simply put the same number as last year. Um, but we expect that number to decrease, which of course increases our taxes. Health rates increased 12.6%. 
Um, so that is an equivalent of $296,038 um, to our budget, which is significant. If you consider that Christina and I budget approximately $100,000 per teacher, so our health, health insurance went up by two teachers plus, or two and a half teachers. Um, or three teachers, sorry. Three teachers, three teachers sorry. Uh, Visbit is also our kind of liability and uh, unemployment, that kind of thing. That They increased their prices 5.5%, which is significant as well and has significant monetary implications. Our local factors is that we do have decreasing student enrollment, um, particularly at Union Elementary School, and that we are in contract negotiations with two of our unions, MREA are the teachers, and MRESSA is the instructional assistant staff. Okay, so we don't know how that contract negotiation will, will turn out because they've just started. This slide the board will remember, for those of you who were here last year, you saw this work last time, and it's from um, Fullen and Quinn's book, Coherence. It's just a reminder of what we really want to focus in when we're talking about the drivers for growth in a school system. Michael Fullen publishes a book about every week, um, and he's really um, renowned in education circles. So um, he's got some, some uh, knowledge behind this. <laughs> Um, and the right drivers, according to Fullen, is that we work on capacity building, collaborative work, um, the pedagogy of our, collabor or our uh, teachers, and systemness, which I'm not really sure is a word, but I'm going to go with Fullen there. Um, and then the wrong drivers would be accountability with no meaning behind it, looking at individual teachers or individual leadership quality, um, focusing on technology for the sake of technology, or fragmented strategies. Um, and the board should be pretty familiar with our theory of growth at, the, at this point because you've seen it quite a bit. However, there it is again. So our theory of growth and um, this, it would be the basis of our continuous improvement plan, which Mia asked about earlier. Um, so we want to build limitless futures for every learner. We're doing it through four pillars, collective responsibility and collaborative practices formalized essential learning, a timely system to enrich, intervene, and remediate, and high quality instruction in every classroom. A little uh, description as to what those are. This next slide breaks down, it's kind of like a preview of what's in the budget. Um, and so each of these columns fits with our pillars and our theory of growth here. And, and we did this work last year and the board responded positively to, to it as to breaking it down like this. So we, we repeated it again in a slightly different format. So in terms of resources for a budget, there are two resources that I'm considering for a budget. It's time, because we pay people for their time, right? As well as money. Um, and so in terms of staffing for collective responsibility and collaborative practices, we're redistributing some staffing for student information and data system. We had a resignation for central office assistance. We're redistributing that um, position to help Mike a little bit more. Mike Barrier, Director of Curriculum and Technology with all the work he's doing in data management um, and just give him, give him some assistance because while he, he does the job of many, uh, it's time to give him some support. So we're gonna use a resignation to provide that support. That's budget friendly, you know, it's, it's neutral. However, um, it is different types of staffing. Our guiding coalitions are a teacher leadership with our administrative team. Each school has a guiding coalition. Um, they are paid for their work and their role is to work with the administration to move our theory of growth forward. And then, of course, our PLCs, professional learning communities, are the, the cornerstone of our collective responsibility and collaborative practices. Moving over for a formalized essential learning, we have teacher leadership um, on our curriculum teams. Mike runs those teams along with the support of the principals. Um, and they are paid for their work as well um, in that capacity. Timely system to enrich, intervene, and remediate. Um, we're actually put, we've actually, if, if anybody has searched us on School Spring lately, we have two positions for social emotional learning interventionists up on School Spring now because we had available funding in our IDEA grant. And so those two positions are actually part of IDEA and we're trying to hire for them this school year. However, they will also be in place for next school year. Again, it's not affecting our local budget because we're using a revenue source to do that. Um, but as the board has heard multiple times, social emotional learning is, is a place of 
a need for our district coming out of the pandemic. So we're working on getting those positions in now. Um, school counselor at MSMS, uh, it's definitely time to help Jenna Barakas out at MSMS for another school counselor. It will make the model in the three Montpelier schools equitable in terms of two counselors in each of the Montpelier schools. Um, based on the, the needs at Main Street Middle School as well as um, just equity across the district in that realm with that many students, we need another school counselor there. Also influences facilities a bit because Andrew will be working on transforming a room um, on the basement floor of um, MSMS into a guidance suite for students and the, and the school counselors. Um, and then also adding a district psychologist. This does have an impact on our local budget. Peggy Sue can answer any questions about the psychologist. This is really around evaluations for students. Mm -hmm. um, currently, we have a special educator who does that work for us. That person will still do that work. However, she's pretty swamped with, with the needs of the district. So um, adding a diff another psychologist will help there. And then high quality instruction in every classroom. It just, just because we have no new staffing doesn't mean we're not working on it. We're just not putting in any new staffing in that area for this budget round in terms of time or, time or money. For professional development, we're continued working on professional learning communities. There's coaching. Each of our principals actually have a PLC coach to help run the system of PLCs. Um, they, so they're going in to, to really work with PLCs and move them forward and differentiated based on where each PLC is in the system and it's different across the entire district. Um, and then Beth works with pretty much the whole school at one time and it looks very different at Roxbury just because of the makeup mm -hmm. and the size. In terms of formalized essential learning with literacy, we're really, Mike will next year work with the groups on word study and continue the work with writing that they've been doing this year. We're also continuing to work with a teachers development group in math for Montpelier High School and Main Street Middle School. They work with adolescent teachers of adolescents in math around math practices and mindset. Um, and Julie is actually a math whiz on our administrative team. So if anybody has any questions around math, Julie is, would be a great person to answer those. And then differentiated math practices with Christian Cordemanch at Union and Roxbury, working a lot with Math Menu and Forma and uh, formative assessment in math. Um, the teachers love him. He's really moved our math, helped us move our math practices forward considerably at Union and Ro Roxbury. So we'll continue with Christian, that work with Christian. In terms of timely system to enrich, intervene, and remediate, um, this year we're focusing in on targeted remediation in tier three and we'll continue to focus in on that because we want to increase the capacity of our intervention team. We need them to be the experts when a kid is tangled. Um, and we're, we're really making significant strides in this area this year because of the attention we're focusing on, but that will continue as well. And then an increased focus on first instruction in tier, tier two intervention, which is again tied to the PLC work um, that's happening. And of course that's time. Um, and then high quality instruction, again, mm -hmm. focus on writing, uh, writing and word study, continue with math, as I've already said, continue with the restorative practices work. That's how we spend our half days, is working on restorative practices. And then we're also, as a leadership team, really studying this year engagement strategies for kids. We are today, just this morning, we were all together at Main Street Middle School going into the sixth grade um, and coming to consensus about what engagement strategies we're looking for. And fine, so it was a great way to start all of our day this morning over at Main Street Middle School with our sixth graders. And then moving down to leadership, the coaching for instructional leadership um, to lead PLCs, we do that work with Solution Tree, which is a national organization that's, that's renowned in their work with uh, professional learning communities and collaboration. We want to ensure there's a collective understanding of our priority standards and the proficiency skills that are attached to that. That takes a lot of time with teachers so that they understand what the why and the how of doing that. Um, and then looking at our schedules to ensure that we're offering the time to intervene, remediate, and enrich, make sure that's available and equitable. Jason, I know, is doing a lot of work around that here at the high school. We have it pretty, pretty much in place in the other three buildings um, with some tweaks to make, but there's still some work to do there. Collective learning regarding effective goal setting and universal skills. Universal skills are what we're looking at at the tier three level. Um, and so making sure that our teachers understand those, that our um, intervention team are experts in providing instruction around the universal skills. 
Uh, and then really working with and coaching, or coaching our instructional leaders um, for, for pedagogical change. I, Mike, Peggy, Sue, Jess, and Murray and I went to a central office leadership retreat in the fall and we really talked about what systems can we put in place to, so that the four of us can better coach our instructional leaders and allow, take over some of the things that they're currently working on so that it allows for our, our really smart um, leadership team over there to be the instructional leaders that they all want to be. So we, I think we'll do questions at the end. Does that, does that sound good? So I apologize for a lot of talking. I'm going to let Christina take over for the glossary of terms because I will mess them up. Thanks for having me here. Um, <clears throat> so the glossary of terms, starting with the general fund, because you're going to see these terms throughout this presentation. So I just wanted to make sure um, you know you are familiar with them. So the general fund is the main operating fund of the school district. Um, opposite of general fund would be all of our grants that Libby was just talking about our consolidated federal programs and IDEA. Um, the capital plan is a long-term fund, fund for planned facility needs, and that's warned as a separate article on your ballot, and you're gonna see that listed separately as we go through this presentation. Education spending, that's the total budget, all of our expenses, um, less non-tax revenues, which can include federal and state grants that we just talked about, and also locally generated revenues such as tu uh, tuition when kids pay, other school districts pay for their students to come here if they don't have a high school or elementary school. Um, we also have some privately paid tuitions and our interest um, revenues. Equalized pupils, um, this is a very important term. It's one of the main factors of where we end up with our tax rate. So equalized pupils is a two-year average daily membership um, so that's enrollment, adjusted by several factors, weighting factors for each level, each grade level. So pre-K, they're weighted at 0.46. Um, secondary is weighted at 1.13. There's also a weight for poverty, which is 1.25. So all those students are weighted differently, and it gets us to our equalized pupils. Um, now, we've heard the weighting study. There's been a weighting study, so they're going to be changing that in the next um, budget cycle. The weighting study doesn't increase this budget. I wouldn't ask that question. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so then it is multiplied by an equalizing ratio to bring the equalized pupils down to the average, um, down to the average daily membership. The property dollar yield. This is another one of the major factors of our tax rate. How we end up at our tax rate. Um, this is an estimated amount. Districts have to spend per pupil to have an equalized tax rate, tax rate of a dollar while generating enough money for the state's ed fund. And we'll get into this a little bit more later. Um, so really it means if we have a good economy or if we have a surplus in the ed fund that um, we'll have a lower tax rate. And this is set by law, like Libby said. They do give us a preliminary number to work with in the December 1st letter, um, but then it's set in May. Typically, or I should say historically, it's only changed 100 to $200 um, when it's set in May. The common level of appraisal, this is the fourth factor um, that determines our tax rate. And so this is the appraised value of property versus the market value. Um, as if we have a higher market value than the CLA is in, is under 100%, we have, to have, we have to generate more tax revenue, so you have a higher tax rate. It attempts to make tax bills fair across the state. So the budget unknowns as of today, um, the equalized pupil count, we should be getting that within a couple of weeks. Uh, the finance director at the agency did put out an email that he was calculating the first round of equalized pupils this week. Uh, the common level of, of appraisal, uh, we should be getting that, I believe, around the 15th. Um, we have a resident professional that knows all about the CLA. Um, on the revenue side, I'm still waiting for the triple E grant, so that's our essential early education grant. Um, and our transportation aid, we haven't received that. On the expense side, our career center, our six semester average hasn't come out yet, so that um, the state pays a portion of that tuition to the career center, and we have to pay a small portion as well. 
<clears throat> and as Libby said earlier, we're still under contract negotiations with two of our unions. The next slide, budget at a glance. Um, so as Libby mentioned, we did try to level fund the expenses. The principals worked really hard to get a level funded um, expenditure line for us. Uh, there are costs that are out of our control, um, such as oil, electricity, health insurance, um, contract negotiations. So what this slide shows you, it compares uh, three years. The first line is the budget, so those are our expenditures. The second line is the capital plan, which um, we've planned to add $10,000 to that, just as inflation continues to grow. So those two together get to your total budget amount, which at this point our expenditures are $28,479,642. This represents a 4.7% increase. The next um, line is our non-tax revenue, so that's our tuition, um, some most of our grants, and our interest, which is about four, almost $5 million. Once you subtract our um, non-tax revenues from the total budget, you get your ed spending, so that's um, <laughs> then divided by your equalized pupils to get your ed spending per pupil. And currently, I'm using uh, the equalized pupils from last year because I just don't know how much it's going to change at this point. So our ed spending per equalized pupil right now is an increase of 4.279%. So um, ed spending is eight, a little well, $18,809. On to the next slide is enrollment projections. Do you want to take this? chart here. <laughs> our enrollment, um, the kindergarten, of course, are for the years out and for you know, kids who aren't in our system yet, that's an estimate. Um, and Christina gives the city clerk a call and says, what's the birth rate look like in Montpelier um, and Roxbury? And sh so these are pure estimates. They're surprisingly not far off most years. <laughs> um, and they're as you can see, there's a projected um, de pretty significant decline in birth rate for um, Montpelier families, for, so incoming kindergartners uh, at Union Elementary especially uh, is decreasing, which of course will decrease over time. We have the last of our bubble coming through Main Street Middle School right now. Julie, is the seventh grade the last of it? Yeah. So our seventh, eighth grade are pretty big, and so they they all they actually match what our ninth and tenth grade look like now at Montpelier High School. So Montpelier High School will continue pretty much with the same same ish number of kids over the next few years, and then the numbers at Main Street Middle School will start to significantly decline um, over the next few years. Uh, so we're looking at these enrollment projections as we're thinking about our budget. And then the next slide here in enrollment projections, you can see uh, the green is when we start really um, butting up against the class size policy that the board has set for our district. And it's also a policy that I monitored this week for the board, so those numbers can be fresh in your head. Um, and that number for 2324, 20, you can see, I'm sorry, between 22 and 23, if you look at grade three, we are knocking, we're suggesting to the board to do a reduction in fourths in our K-6 <coughs> education to match the enrollment production. Um, and that actually will help us in our budget for the school counseling position at MSMS to make that an equally, you know, to just reappropriate the funds from a K-6 educator to a school counselor. The next is for Roxbury enrollment. Um, these are from the October 1st count, correct, Christina? Um, so Rock, Roxbury has a pretty steady, like it's not raising or lowering in any significant way, what we're projecting anyway. Um, so it's pretty much steady the way, where it is. And this is without the pre-K, which is important to note at Roxbury, because actually our Roxbury pre-K is, is big this year. <laughs> we have a few tuition paying <coughs> students coming into our Roxbury pre-K this year. Just enrollment, you can see it in a different format with the line graph here. 
Um, so you can see how the decline is happening with the top red line at, at the top or the projected decline. So for staffing overview, these are staffing that we're suggesting to put into this year's budget. From a district perspective, the psych psychologist would be 1.0 FTE um, added to our staff. At Union Elementary School, we're suggesting a social emotional learning interventionist. Again, we actually have um, adver we have this advertisement out currently, um, but that would be an ad for next year as well. Um, and then we're suggesting a reduction in force for K-6 licensure so that we can reappropriate that fund into a school counselor at Main Street Middle School because of the low enrollment, K-3. At Main Street Middle School, we're suggesting a school counselor addition at 1.0 FTE. Uh, again, a social emotional learning interventionist at 1.0 FTE. Um, again, that is advertised currently. And then additionally, adding a literacy interventionist at Main Street Middle School. Currently, we have one literacy interventionist at Main Street Middle School, and we have a need for another. So that will equal out more across for the needs of Union Elementary School having the most literacy intervention and math intervention, Main Street Middle School having more of what they need as soon as we can hire a math interventionist that's open currently. Um, but currently, we have an open math interventionist position at Main Street Middle School one filled math interventionist, one filled literacy interventionist. And so we're suggesting to the board to add a literacy interventionist there. You're on, Christina. All right, so this slide is just to sh point out, highlight what we're about to dive into, all the expenditures. Um, so we'll be focusing on that $28 million number right there. Um, the next slide is going to show you uh, the school comparison, the expenses by school. This is budget by pupil, so this is a head count. It's not equalized pupils or ADM. It's just by the student um, head count. <clears throat> and now we're going to dive into the expenses by program. So we're going to look at general education separately from special education, so on and so forth. Um, I'm just going to walk down uh, each line. So general education is up right now about 5%. And the common theme that you're going to hear me say throughout each of these programs is the health insurance increase. Because we have staff in each one of these programs, the health insurance um, increase uh, takes up a lot of, of what you're going to see as the percentage increase. So under general education, it's the health insurance premiums, it's um, contract negotiations, and an added in interventionist, which is paid through um, ESSER. So that's an, that, that will have an offsetting revenue. The special education uh, budget is up 3.96. Again, that has a lot to do with health insurance um, and contract <laughs> negotiations. The tech center, or career center tech, uh, tuition, uh, we're not anticipating much change in the FTE as far as students that attend that program. Co-curricular and athletics, that is up 8% um, due to increase in the wage schedule and transportation. Uh, we increased uh, the Racial Justice Alliance position. We added JV's, uh, boys JV volleyball, a math club, and affinity alliance. So we added a couple different um, clubs there. Under student support, um, which includes nurse, guidance, social worker, speech, OT, and PT, um, this is the additional school counselor at MSMS, the health insurance, of course, and the contract negotiations. Under support staff, which includes the library, uh, technology, curriculum, and professional development, in this line item, I just want to highlight that um, we consolidated all of the copier contracts and cell phones. We used to show them in each program, and we wanted to tie that all together so it's under one expenditure line. Um, so that's what the biggest increase is there. Uh, <clears throat> we also plan on doing some network increases that will have an offsetting revenue from E-Rate. Uh, Mike Berry and I are working with our E-Rate consultant to really maximize the revenue that we can generate from network upgrades um, and other hardware and software needs. So we'll be seeing an increase on that revenue side. The school board and slash superintendent line, there's an increase in our audit expenses. We had to change audit um, firms this current year. Uh, 
our previous auditors didn't have enough time for us. <laughs> so we do have an increase in our audit expenses. The principal office and the special services admin, there's an increase. This mostly is just the health insurance premiums going up. Business services, uh, health insurance premiums. Buildings and grounds, uh, they have an increase about three and a half percent, and this is due to heating and electricity costs. Those are costs that are completely out of our control. And under the safety line, um, we are increasing that budget uh, because we're replacing doors and locks throughout all the buildings. So that just reflects what we've been doing in our plan. It seems like, you know, 23% seems like a lot, but it's just, it's $20,000. So <laughs> uh, we have a small decrease in transportation based on actuals. <clears throat> and debt service, there's a small change in the principal and interest payments. And then we are still uh, budgeting for a fund transfer to our food service to, because we're gonna anticipate another deficit in that, that program. The next slide just shows these expenses um, in a different way. So you can see, you know, color-coded how each program takes up our total budget. And the next slide, again, is just another way to look at our year-to-year -year programs and the increases. And now expenses by category. So now we're gonna break it out. Instead of like general education, special education, that sort of thing, we're gonna look at salary and benefits, um, contracted services. <coughs> I'll just walk through line by line. Uh, salaries right now, we're, reflect, we're showing about a three, almost 4% increase. This reflects our actual staffing, which means um, our current staff, but we do have open positions, so we have to budget. We budget kind of midline for that. I think that was one of the questions that Mia asked, um, which I'll go over. But here, uh, we do show some open positions, and like I said, we budget kind of midline for that, and also we'll budget uh, you know, a single health insurance plan or a two-person health insurance plan. It's always uh, a guessing game when we have open positions when we're budgeting. So health insurance, um, this sh reflects the actual coverage of, the, of those employees that we have. And we always budget 75% of our HRA, our health reimbursement account usage. So the other benefits, uh, FICA, so federal um, payroll taxes, dental, vision, life and disability, we're seeing about four and a half, five percent increase there. Professional services, this is up 8.68%, and cr this current year, and you'll hear it when I'm doing my financial reports for the current year, we've had a major increase in our 504 requirements. Um, so we're budgeting to keep all those in place for next year, so we're not caught off guard like we are this current year. <laughs> um, and then this just normal year-to-year -year increases for services. The purchase services, this was building-based decreases, so this is one of the areas where the principals were able to look at and decrease some of their um, purchase services. Contracted services, these are just normal year-to-year -year increases that we're expecting for um, our contracts. Tuition, uh, there's a small increase of in out-of-district placement, and that would be um, for special education. Supplies, technology, and books. So this again is the network increases, but we're gonna see a major um, increase in our offsetting revenue for this. Utilities are up, that's oil and electricity. Equipment, we were able to decrease this. Again, that was the work of the principals um, looking at their building-based decreases. Dues and fees, I looked at this closely. There's a lot of increases to our professional associations district-wide. Um, Many of the administrators, we all belong to associations in, in our field. Uh, principal and interest, this is our long-term principal and interest payments that you usually see on our financial reports, the bonds that we have outstanding. And then again, the fund transfer, which is for food service. <clears throat> the next slide again just shows you the pie chart so you can see the percentages of uh, what makes up our budget. And I like to, I don't like to highlight, but I'll highlight that 75% of our budget is salary and benefits. So 
Next slide again is just a year to year comparison of these different categories. Now we'll talk about the revenues. The first line on the revenues is the education spending grant. So that is um, the taxes that are raised by our towns and the ed fund payments. So that's kind of the last number that gets filled in once we fill in these rest of what we call local revenues or, um, or grants. Uh, the tech on behalf payment, this is based on the six semester average, so this is still unknown at this point. The tech unenrolled, the, you can see an actual number there. We never really budget for this. It's, um, it's a required uh, revenue and expenditure entry from the agency of education, so we don't budget for that. The small schools grant, which we still receive, that will remain level. State transportation aid, um, this is based on the FY22 actuals. The block grant, the new special ed block grant, uh, it's not the reimbursement formula anymore, it's just a, a flat dollar amount, so the AOE calculated that and we have an increase of 12% in, in our block grant. The extraordinary costs, so this is students that have services that cost over, oh, I'm gonna, I might get this wrong, $65,000 I think it is for next year. Um, we're re reimbursed at a certain rate. So that's increasing 13% ba based on our actual student needs. Uh, the triple E grant I referenced earlier, I'm still waiting to hear on that. So I'm just using the same number as last year. State placed, currently we're not anticipating any state placed revenue for next year. And driver's education, this is a very small dollar amount. Every, it, dependent on um, students passing our driver's ed course. And tech ed transportation, this won't change much at all. Um, we still do the same amount of runs and that sort of thing. High school completion is not anticipated. We sometimes get small revenues for that. And then we move into our grants, so IDEAB and IDEAB Preschool, this, these two are special education grants, so they match the expense budget. CFP, the Consolidated Federal Programs, Title I, Title II, and Title IV, those all match our expenses dollar for dollar. That's re they're all reimbursable grants. ESSER three, we plan on using um, next year, and that matches uh, our expense budget. Same with Medicaid and EPSCT, or otherwise known as MAC money. Our tuition, um, we're counting on the same amount of tuition for the lo uh, local, other local schools. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, M let me back up. <laughs> uh, we're in anticipating a decrease. This current year, we had a major increase, um, but they'll be moving on. So we're gonna see a decrease in our tuition. And our interest earnings, I did increase that based on actuals because of our large fund balance and the way interest rates are, going, are playing out right now. So I increased that just a tad. Facility uh, rentals, I left that um, level funded. I haven't seen much change in that. And special ed excess cost reimbursement, this is a reimbursement um, based on students that are either tuitioned or in the lottery or the uh, agreement with U32, if they have any special education uh, needs, we can bill back excess costs. Miscellaneous, um, you'll see a large increase here and this is where the E-rate money is gonna come in. So we're hoping to see an additional uh, 27 to $30,000 there. And the after school enrichment program, uh, we're still anticipating that to be level funded. And in this draft of the budget, before we knew what the property yield was, we increased the fund balance, um, or use the use of the reserve fund. So we went up to $400,000 again, because at the time, <laughs> as Libby mentioned, we were looking at a significant increase in tax rates. And we can revisit that at the end of this presentation. Discuss if they want us to look at that or not. 
Uh, the next slide is our capital plan. So for fiscal year 24, we are recommending $270,000 uh, be tr tr um, used for our capital plan. We are starting the year, fiscal year 24, with a balance of 208000 So working with Andrew, I've worked through um, the projects that we anticipate in completing for next year. So you can just take a look at that. <clears throat> And the next slide, this, this is what everybody's waiting for, is <laughs> the tax rates. Um, so there's four factors that affect our tax rates. And you, only, you as the board only have control of one of them, which is the expenditures, which we just walked through. So starting with the general budget um, and the capital plan. So our total budget is 28 million that we're presenting today, 28 million 479. And then we move into our non-tax revenues, which I just went over most of those revenues. It was that first line that it, that generates the tax, the revenue, tax revenue. And now we're using the equalized pupils from last year, and this is something that um, that the board unfortunately does not have control over. So we're still waiting for that number. Once you take your education spending um, divided by your equalized pupils, you get your ed spending per equalized pupil. And this is what's noted in your article that you warn every year. So right now our ed spending per pupil is $18,809. We then divide that by um, the one known factor, well the second known factor that we have right now which is the property dollar yield. And you'll see that it went up $2,000. Now. In the letter that they sent us on uh, December 1st, they say they have a $64 million um, surplus in the reserves, for, and that's why they're increasing the yield so much. And you'll notice the prior year, they also increased it, about $2,000. Um, in my career of 17 years, these are unprecedented increases in the yield. You know, usually the yield increases a couple hundred dollars, maybe, if we're lucky. Um, it has a major impact on your tax rate. Um, so once, okay, so property, the property dollar yield is 15,479. That would give you an equalized residential tax rate of $1.21, 22 cents. The next factor that we have no control over is the CLA. Uh, currently, I, I did use a number for Montpelier, which was a decrease, um, and I left Roxbury the way that they are. So those two numbers we have no control over, and that's what gives you what ends up giving you your residential tax rate with the CLA. So for currently with this budget, it would be a dollar fifty-four for Montpelier and a dollar twenty-nine for Roxbury. <clears throat> so with this, with the current assumptions, the tax rate would decrease by eight point zero three percent for Montpelier, which is thirteen cents. And for Roxbury, it would decrease by 10.31%, um, which is about 14 cents. And what that looks like for your tax bill is on the next slide. <clears throat> In Montpelier, if you're looking at a property value of $100,000, your current tax bill is about 16 hundred dollars um, for FY 24 with these assumptions it would decrease by $135 and then you can see a $200,000 house versus a $300,000 house you can see the difference that they would all be decreases and the same is true for Roxbury the $100,000 house value would be a $148 decrease the impact on these um, decreases could change dramatically based on the unknown factors that I've talked about. Um, also, just a reminder, these, these assumed taxes are based solely on property value, but about two-thirds of Vermont households receive an income sensitivity credit, and that's something that um, our residents would fill out while they're doing their taxes every year. <clears throat> and 
And the next slide just shows you the history of the tax rates, um, either with the CLA, CLA and without the CLA. Without the CLA, you can see that Montpelier and Roxbury would have the same um, tax rate. The next slide is the non-residential tax rate. So there was a question about who this affects. So this is all the commercial properties, including rentals, um, second households. Uh, I guess that's, that's the majority of it. And that is the end of the good stuff. <laughs> if there's any questions. So we're happy to answer any questions. Um, and the board should discuss if they want us to consider based on knowns that continue to come in like equalized people, um, if we still want to keep that $400,000 from the fund balance, the original plan was $200,000 for this next budget year, or if the board wants us to decrease that. Um, so it just would be something to discuss for you all to give us some direction on. Uh, first off, uh, thank you. The presentation was excellent as always. and. <laughs> Welcome, Christine, to your first budget presentation. Is, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, uh, okay. great job as always. Um, and we like the continuation of, of, you know, Grant kind of began us with these great presentations, and you guys have, have updated a little and given your own look, so we appreciate that as well. Um, kind of first question on the, the, the $400,000, like how late can we move? Because it seems like equalized people is going to be the biggest is the biggest number out there right now that we're going to get between now and the time we pass the budget that could change that. Could we could we make a decision based on equalized people and you know, oh, yeah. move oh, it yeah. back, move oh, it back yeah. in? Absolutely. There's plenty of time to make that decision. Yeah. I mean, just as long as we have it ready to go to print in January, then middle of January. Yeah. Yeah, um, you have at least two more board meetings to. Yeah. Figure and, that out once we know more knowns. And, and do you have an off the top of your head, like if we moved, you know, two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand, yeah, of that out and kind of replaced it with just tax funder? Like, what would the impact on the tax rate be? It would How be much? Um, roughly one to two cents if it was two hundred thousand. You said. Which translates into what percentage was? Oh, as Sorry. far as well, it'd be de. It would continue to be a decrease, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, no, but less yeah, of I'm decrease. sorry. If you're if you're decreasing the revenue, then you have to increase your, what you're bringing in for taxes. Yeah, so but it's the, going to increase your tax rate. It's going to increase the tax rate, but the tax rate would still be a decrease, right? <laughs> Currently, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. So somewhere between zero and eight. Yeah. Right. Um, questions for Libby or Christine? Siji? Um, for the budget unknowns for the uh, triple E grant and transportation aid. Is the amount unknown, or is it unknown whether or not we're going to receive it? Oh, it's or the both? amount is unknown. Oh, okay. Yeah, I should have made that clear. Thank you. Is, but if everyone knows, understands, then that's fine. I'll just stay here quietly. <laughs> um, if it's helpful, so I, I, my, my day job, do I'll do it. <laughs> uh, the other question is, do you think that's the only number? Do you think it's going to, that's going to move? Um, it will move a little bit, but I think for the purposes of this conversation, this, close. this is close. Um, so, uh, and Montpelier is currently undergoing a reappraisal, so once that is wrapped up this in 2023, so our all of our grand list values, our property values will be equalized back to 100, so our CLA will look very different when that's done. Our property values will also be different. Um, so your taxes will be the same. Yeah, yeah. So the actual that's tax the raised on a particular home won't change that much. Um, so the CLA, the common level of appraisal, is um, a statistical analysis that we do at the tax department to see what the real estate market is doing to get a better sense of what our property values truly are. It's done over a three-year period of time. So as you can imagine, the last couple of years, the housing market in Vermont, which was already really strained, has gone really, really under pressure. Um, there's, all, there's far more demand than there is supply. And so in a lot of communities, 
the CLA is dropping a lot, meaning that what they're what the houses are listed at on the grand list and on your property tax bills is a lot less than what they're going for on the market. So the CLA is a factor applied to your tax rate to try to sort of accommodate that so that your tax rate is still raising about what the housing market in Montpelier or in Roxbury is supposed to bring. So in a lot of Vermont communities around the state, even though it's done over a three-year window, so it's sort of softened, these three years of COVID real estate are really, um, really dropping CLAs in a lot of communities. So while, so the, the education tax, the, the December 1 letter, which the tax department put out, um, just wants to caution folks, even though it sounds like all really good news, that the CLA, especially in some of the towns whose grand lists are really out of date or whose real estate markets were really hot, um, is going to be significant. So to just sort of like temper that enthusiasm. But these numbers are based on sort of like what ours have been up to now, and they're within reason. And like I said, Montpelier is already reappraising. So I think for the purposes of our conversation, this is numbers that we can use, but if that's helpful. Yeah, yeah a couple years, yeah. So that would be less likely to change? Yeah, Roxbury might end up being closer to 100% because those values are actually more fresh. Okay. Montpelier hasn't actually gone through reappraisal since I think like 2011. 10 years. Ago. So they were already really stale mm -hmm. before COVID. Yeah, the market was hot. Yeah. And towns have had trouble getting people to reappraise because they've been so busy. So it's been tough. I have a question. The equalized people number um, you've for this purpose of this budget you, you've assumed or you put it at the same as last year right mm -hmm. um, but the year before it was about 12 points higher mm -hmm. um, what's what's the general trend is it going down is it, <coughs> does yeah, it change for most all school districts equalized pupils are dropping they're dropping yeah, yeah we were an anomaly <coughs> you know, the past four or five years in terms mm -hmm. of one of, I think, two or three school districts in the state going up, and now we're flat going again and starting to head south, unfortunately. So. In class, that's weighted at that 1.14, and you have a small preschool class coming in at 0.46 as far as the weighting, that can throw your equalized pupils off. Um, and really decrease them. So it, ta it takes like three preschoolers to come in for every graduating senior. So yeah, I mean, it, it bumps up their, your um, per student spending, right? I'm uh, sorry? It bumps up your per student spending if that goes Correct. down, right? Yeah. So that has a big impact. Um, so if we think it's, it's, do we think it's gonna go down based on? Um, based on our enrollment. Yes. At the UBS. That means that it, uh, the eventual rate will go up. Yes. Right? Okay. But you haven't factored in the, the, the updated property dollar yield, right? We yeah, have factored that in. You have factored that in. Mm -hmm. okay. That was the good news. Yeah. It's Friday. So, <laughs> yeah, so you have factored that in. Yeah. Here. So, so good news is factored in, but the bad news is not. Right. So it's, it's still <laughs> yellow. Uh, no. It's still yeah, yellow because it's anticipated. Traditionally, if it's going down, if we think it's going to go down, um, that's. I'm just trying to get a sense of if that's going to go up. That this. You are correct. Okay. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. about, um, and I know Libby, I think you shared this with us in an equity committee me meeting recently, but the, um, the special education audit and the timing of that and like if the results of that have a budget implication and maybe now that I kind of put two and two together a little bit more like there's a SPED block grant basically, anything that would come out of that you basically work with that budget to respond to that? Okay. Yeah. And we probably will and get, we don't get the results from the audit until April, until April. <clears throat> so that won't impact this budget yeah it could potentially impact future budgets but not not this one yep. right now <laughs> yep. 
Um, I did wonder on slide 18 if the per pupil for RVS was based on, I think you said it wasn't based on ADM, but if it was based on like the 48 students, like our, I think, as of December 1 numbers versus the 39, which is our October number. The October 1st number so of the current year. Okay. So that would come down given if we were to factor in an actual number of students because it's 48 that we currently have enrolled? Uh, I don't know if the number has changed since, since October 1st. That's what you got right now. Uh, 48. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah, I mean fluctuates all year long, I right. guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And last question for now, I just wondered if the, the RFL numbers, like I know lots of districts have kind of chronically have difficulty, you know, getting RFL numbers to be, you know, true, true to life and accurate. And I was wondering like how accurate do we think the RFL numbers are and if any like funding revenues are contingent on our RFL numbers? Uh, reduced and free, free lunch. Free, free and reduced, sorry. Reduced. FRL. RFL is Roxbury Free Library. <laughs> <laughs> FRL, free and reduced. So, yeah, I was just wondering how accurate we think those are and if there's any, you know, revenue implications, good, bad, or otherwise. Yeah, so this current year, well, last year we had free meals for all students, yeah. um, federally funded. This year um, it's split between federal funds and state funds, so all children are getting free and reduced meals, or free meals, <laughs> sorry. Um, what's going to happen next year? I'm, I'm not clear on. I haven't heard anything. So, Mike, you work with this particular data probably the closest out of all of us. Yeah. Do you know if there's? A, I think what you're asking is there is there a decrease in that number? Or has it stayed the same? Or yeah. And do like does the district ever make a you know I mean I, the paperwork goes out and you can't you know you can't force anybody to. Uh, fill it out, but I know that those numbers also, you know, can have implications in whether or not you are eligible for certain funding streams, and I wonder, right, um, a few different grants. Mike, what do you? Yeah, I, I would say it's not 100% accurate at all, especially yeah. with the free meals, the motivation yeah. to fill out the paperwork is much lower than right. the last few years. Yep. We do uh, have direct cert which goes through the states of families that are receiving support are automatically qualified, so we get that information. Mm -hmm. So that's very accurate. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we have, we've seen a market decrease in paperwork coming in in the last two years across all settings in that. And every time the state is having conversations around universal meals or not, that is the thing that we bring up, right. that you need a different way then to calculate grant funding. They've let us use uh, in our CFP grants, we've been able to choose which year's FRL number we want to use, mm -hmm. and most have used the last year before the free meals, mm -hmm. yeah, because it's the most accurate statistically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, on the slide 19, the staff support line, you mentioned that you moved the copier contract and cell phone expenses into that, right? You moved the copier contracts and cell phone? Expenses to tech budget. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where they, this is the line that we, they came in, is that? Yeah, so we were just trying to consolidate um, where we're expensing, and we have 1,500 expense lines right now. <laughs> yeah. So we're just trying to get it all under one So budget. when we are doing, when you are, seeing the trend or, or looking at other years. Is that adjusted um, so that 1.73 or, yeah, 1.731148, that number included the expenses that were in oh, some other right. categories? I'm sorry, did you? I, I, I don't think the answer is, I'm going to try and answer. I think the answer is no, because I think in FY22, things like cell phone expenses were somewhere else. Yes. I think that's what you're asking, okay. right? Yeah, so they were somewhere else. And yeah. so they're not, obviously, we, we're not showing the FY22, that somewhere else line. So that 1.731 includes <coughs> those somewhere else lines. Now that's folded into that. I was, just, I was trying to compare. And so 
I saw the 1.731148 1, number. Um, so if you moved the cell phone expenses into 1.944 number, right? Because that's how they came in there. So 1.731 1 number also included the actual cell phone expenses from other categories that were moved. They're in the building budgets, correct? Um, and copiers? They're be in a different program. So you might have some in special education for our, you oh. know, our special ed department. They have cell phones or copiers, you know, sent um, in their department. Or you might see it in principals, the principal office. They had their own line item for copiers and cell phones. So it's kind of spread out throughout all of these programs, and we were trying to get it into where it belongs, yeah, really. So is. In all of these programs, the actual numbers for all of these programs that are in there, have they gone down for the 22 because that line was moved into the staff support? Yeah, that's where you saw some of the decreases in the principal lines. Yeah. In the building baselines, that's part that's, of that decrease. Not the whole decrease, yeah, but yeah. it's part so of that decrease. That's what I was trying to yeah. That's one yeah. of the reasons why this has happened. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. Sorry for the confusion. No. Sorry for changing. <laughs> no, it's okay. That's fine. It's, it's going to make everybody's life easier over here. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, on page 28 for tax rates, what is the actual significance of the income sensitivity credit on households? What is the actual impact? Of yeah, it? like what is the significance I, of it, if, sure. you, if you know? Sure. Uh, well, I don't have a, a specific answer, but um, you can go onto the Department of Tax website, and you can see by each town how many residents in that town qualify for income sensitivity. So I didn't pull up Montpelier, you know, or Roxbury individually, um, but there is a resource out there that you can see how many residents within your town qualify, as long as they're filling out that paperwork yeah, um, when is they're it doing. The homestead? Yeah, the homestead declaration. So basically, if you if you qualify for it, then you don't have to pay the school budget, but the that part of your taxes. Well, right? you have to. You may have to pay a portion of it. It, it depends on your income, so mm -hmm. it's uh, and your household value. So um, what happens is the state ends up paying a portion of what you owe for your homestead, and a homestead is a house and two acres. So anything over that it, um, doesn't qualify for income sensitivity. So uh, they pay the taxes right to the town directly, so then the resident doesn't have to. So There's on the resident's tax bill, they actually see what their full value and their full tax bill would be, and then it has a reduced by a state payment, which was calculated at the tax department based on their home income, and, and as Christina said, house plus two acres. So then what you actually would have to write a check for and pay is reduced based on your income. Okay. But it's only the school budget portion of your taxes that's reduced, right? Like it wouldn't be like what you're paying There's for another city layer services. for um, another level of um, income that can be sensitized further, and a municipality could choose to do that. Mm. But um, you all set? I think so. With that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cool to me. Tax okay. <laughs> so I was surprised to see because after I mean after I read your letter, and um, I was sort of preparing myself for this insane increase, and then to see a decrease in the tax rate. I'm just curious, like what the philosophy was going into prepare. So in, in and I know that it could still go up a little bit once we get the actual numbers, but you said only by two cents or so. It depends on how much our equalized pupils drop. If they drop 20, then you're gonna see a huge increase. In and do you have a sense of what the spectrum is that we could potentially see in terms I don't, of the drop? And unfortunately we don't, and we go through four different versions. There's no way Christina could give a guess to that because just for example, last year we got the first version of equalized pupils in late December, and we didn't get the final version of equalized pupils until I think March, April, maybe, could have even been May. <laughs> they go through a lot of iterations. The first round. 
The first time. First yes. Time. Okay. Yeah, definitely. But Emma, keep in mind that Christina had put Thursday when I wrote my superintendent's report. She used the dollar yield from last year because we didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. With the with thirteen thousand whatever it was last year, Montpelier was going to have a six point seven percent increase in their tax rate. That dollar yield, only the dollar yield, that was the only the only factor that was changed brought it to an 8% decrease. Yes, it was like a 15% 15 swing. You can ask this man, because he, he saw me right yes. after I found out, and I was yeah. like, ah! <laughs> this is making more sense, but I'm wondering, so like if the actual numbers come in, is there an opportunity here yes. to add something to the budget? To, because I, I just am not sure if we have to provide a decrease in yes. the tax rate. Yes, that's a really good question. Emma. We are already thinking we're waiting to see what the equalized people is going to do, the first draft of it. Mm -hmm. um, and we've already told the principals to prioritize the things on that okay. last cut. Like, what was those things on those? We want to look at one-time expenditures. We're not looking at additional FTE mm -hmm. um, because that has yearly impact, right? Yeah. But what we are looking at, what are the one-time expenditures that didn't make that last painful cut that we could add back in. And we'll talk about that once we get the equalized people. There's also things in this budget that I know the district needs that we that aren't included. For instance, the um, the permanent subs in each building, that's not a part of this budget. Mm -hmm. um, and for the buildings who have been able to hire that, that's been a real savior on some days to have that extra person um, there. So. That would be one thing that we put back in because that has worked for us this year and we're not expecting the sub -store shortage to go away next year. Um, so we have a list. Um, the principals are already thinking in that way. Um, we'll give them a dollar amount that they can look at once we know a little bit more, especially Jason. We'll give him a dollar amount. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then they'll start looking at the, their last prioritized cuts and, and what can be put back in for one-time expenditures. Absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, I would love to hear, I know that we've invited them all here tonight. I would love to hear some of those ideas. I know that there's a little bit of a process involved in like how much information you want to provide before we know that we have any extra money. So I will honor that, but I would love to hear like a couple of sure. ideas if you're willing to allow. <laughs> Another way to ask the question is what have you had to say no to? There you go. So far. Julie, would you like to start? And what, why don't you all come up to the Oh, yes, please. It's hard to hear from. Um, no, you can sit right where you are. That's, there's two seats. <laughs> two seats. Two seats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, Christina. Oops, sorry. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so some of the things that we were um, looking at, you know, is uh, really some of the. Um, uh, similar to some of the things that Libby had talked about earlier with some of our priorities and some of our newer programs. So one is this year uh, is our first year with having an innovation space with Ian Lai Rosenberg um, heading that up and having a, a maker space. Um, so there's some equipment and things like that to bring that program up to where we were looking at. So we made some cuts to that. Some of that was furniture and some of that was also um, equipment for different types of um, uh, programming and pieces there. Uh, other parts of it also was um, some ways in which we were looking to hope to beep, beef up our both our racial justice alliance as well as our BIPOC space um, and being able to provide some more resources for that. So we had trimmed um, that down. Um, and uh, then there was also some additional electronic um, uh, wants or needs, like with different types of tech devices with our 7 and 8 team. Um, looking to try to increase some of their capacity um, with some different technologies that they could use, like that would be for their classroom and their spaces in those rooms. So those were some of the um, initial pieces in there, and there's some other, some smaller kind of other items that we kind of pulled little pieces and dollars here and there out of um, that would be happy to, to bring in, but those are like the three things that, like as I'm thinking about um, what would be the first things to look to push back in too. No? Okay. Um, Jason, Jason, we'll yeah, have you uh, next. I'm talking about the high school. Just want to make sure you know that I'm hearing everything you're saying. I think it's on tape. <laughs> <laughs> you are being recorded. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Um, similar to Julie, uh, we want to continue to support our BIPOC and, and Racial Justice Alliance. 
And so that might look at some more professional de development, not only for students, but for our staff um, training and education. Um, also, the person that works with our students, we're trying to, we may lose a grant, we're not sure yet. Um, and so how do we counterbalance that to ensure that the person can work with us next year? And then to get to the budget that you saw, we um, maybe put off some athletic, uh, big athletic expenditures. Um, possibly, possibly anyone listening, uh, replacing the two scoreboards and another outside bench, um, enclosed outside bench. Um, so those were probably the first things that we would put back. Thanks. Thank you. The second one you said training something? Professional. Professional development for staff. Okay. Under DEI. In, oh, that was the first one, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, and oh, that was just a. And then we had uh, stipend. Rachel, you're talking Rachel. about Rachel's stipend, yeah. 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 So Rachel works with our um, BIPOC students as a affinity space. Affinity space mentor. Mentor. Um, she works at a part-time basis now. With both the middle school and the high school, and we just want to continue that work and, and see how we can even expand it if possible. Gotcha. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Everybody. Thanks. And we do offer stipends to. Oh yeah. The leaderships of those of those oh, clubs yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's included. Beth and Katie were interested. Yeah. They were pretty much level funded, or and Katie even really allocated funds that had been in the UAS budget for many years, but never really used. Um, and so she actually came to us first go with a pretty level funded budget. Um, so, and Beth was very similar with that as well at Roxbury. So it was more our adolescent principals who, uh, who had the big increases. Um, that had to make some really hard prioritization. Peggy, Sue, and Mike, was there anything that you really looked at from your programming? No, I think we, um, I mean, we just looked at kind of what we had, if, if there were places we allocated, but we didn't have anything around. We need to get fully staffed before we can start that. Yeah, yeah. True. And I would just say the big thing for UES was the SEL intervention, but we were able to find funding for that this year. That was a big thing that was at the top of our list. And so, got to follow, it sounds like most of these expenses are, are one time expenses. So, you know. What we add back in will be one time expenses, yes. So, if we have a difficult situation with the, yes. the waiting next year, it's not mm. kind of a. We're not putting a ourselves in a corner. Yeah. We're not putting ourselves in a corner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I mean, I know we're kind of. We're kind of oh, oh Andrew, 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 I didn't see you, Andrew. Come over to the microphone because Anna can't hear. Yeah, like, Andrew's like, wait, I Liv. Need. Liv. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't sitting with the team over there. Yeah. Right? No, well, it did in exactly that, and I, I want to say this here because I want you folks to yeah. hear it because when you folks are thinking about those programs, we need to support those and make sure we have the money because when you look at the facilities line, and it says a five percent increase. I would actually say that's a decrease in that our energy costs have gone up by 30%. So I've actually cut the budget by about $100,000. And that reflects counseling spaces and teacher lounges and all of those things. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. And also, not only that, that percentage was based on a reduction that was from the year before, right? So I'm already a hundred grand back. And now we're, we're not, we didn't go back to the previous, from the previous budget, and now we've got energy cutting into that as well. So um, I just wanted to make that clear, and yeah, I may yeah. actually have that, ask you to put that as a note, as well as just remind you guys that. You won't let I me want forget. To it's fine. So that's it. Well, I think that's what you had under facilities was a 5% increase. <laughs> increase. Yeah. But you were saying that's a $30,000 $30, decrease or no? What's the, no, no, what was the number you followed that up so with? So what we did is we had our budget. And yes, we've added 5%. But we've, we've gonna, we're going to have probably a 30% increase in energy costs right. over last year's budget. So we got hit this year. We, we were paying like $2 a gallon for oil last winter. This winter we're paying a little over $3 a gallon. Um, so we've had to put that money toward energy and take it out of building projects. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that the previous budget, we had reduced it to, to 
hit a limit. So these buildings look great, and I, I want to make a little, if you guys are here, these fans ramping up and ramping down, that's because of the new DDC control system we have in here. It's reading the stale air and turning on fresh air in this building, and that's because we funded it, and I just want to keep that up. Hear the fans go on, or was that just Andrew's? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I didn't hear anything back there. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So, sorry. I had a question. Excuse me, Andrew. So, I think it did show that, like, the um, utilities cost was like the greatest increase. It was like a 16%. So, can we anticipate any, um, you know, decrease in that cost based on the installation of the new windows? By the time we recognize that, we're we're going to have to stagger those windows. That's not going. We're not going to do a whole building all at once, and we'll it'll it'll slowly. Yeah. 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 Has there been any savings realized from the heat pump installation at RVS? Too early to tell. Uh, we're getting our oil receipts. I suspect that we're we'll see if Gillespie starts changing their delivery schedule. But it's still and this warm weather has been just really tough. But. They're, they're fired up and they're working and we've kind of got, we've got them all set at 70 degrees and that's what's heating three of the classrooms and, and the offices and we've got the approval, your approval to do the three more classrooms, so. Uh, no, with heat pumps you want to just keep them rolling. You just keep them, yeah. They're not good at sort of quick ramp up, but they're, they're good at just percolating. So, that's my two cents. <laughs> And I apologize that I didn't call no, you over. No, I'm lurking in the car. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't uh, seen that man move that fast since we started working together. <laughs> so, I want to be cognizant of time and also kind of the process we're going to hear, you know, a presentation a few times. I mean, it sounds like there's some perhaps desire to have some numbers maybe put back in, at yeah. least in terms of we will. Seeing, yeah. seeing what that was. and. Just we're going to get the equalized people on December fifteenth, so you should know that by the twenty first, in case yes. that throws it for a loop. For a loop. Mm -hmm. um, There's a good chance people will have the CLA by then too. They're they're cranking ahead of oh schedule. Oh wow, that would be oh that would be unprecedented. <laughs> uh, now I jinxed it. I was going to say, Joel. Yeah. Um, and what about thoughts on the uh, the okay. money? F yeah, the other fund balance in terms of. Yeah, backing that out of the, the budget and, and putting that in, in tax. Thoughts on thoughts on that? Do you, do you want to see maybe kind of just two or three scenarios with some, some numbers thrown in to see where it's at? Yeah. In, in my mind, I'm more interested in seeing us spend the money and transfer money from our fund balance into the Ed Fund to meet these needs yeah. than pull back on and, and hold on to that money and only tra and only transfer a small amount yeah. of. So I would, you know, I know there's a lot of unknowns, but from where we sit right now, I would rather see us transfer $400,000 $400, and meet some of these needs than, than drop it to transferring $200,000. Yeah. Other thoughts? I mean, could we look at I mean, we have a, like, if the numbers hold, they have an 8% decrease. So, you know, if, yeah. if, if we kind of aim for, like, a no tax cr increase at all, like, how much could we do? Well, we can bring, once we know more yeah. of the unknowns, Chris, we can have Christina do that math for us yeah. and have those numbers. Like, if we put this amount from the fund balance in, the tax rate would be here, yeah. according to what we know right now. If we put this amount, the tax rate would be here. Like, we can do that. Yeah. Math. Christina's got massive spreadsheets that she's a whiz on, so she can do all that work. Yeah, no, I, I think I agree with Mia, and it sounds like the others on the board that uh, meeting meeting the needs is priority one, and then um, yeah, because we have fund balance Brett. I mean, I also agree, but I, based on what I th the way I think this works, if the equalized pupil pupils goes down by one hundred the tax rate in Montpelier ends up the same as it was last year, more or less, and the tax rate in Roxbury is, is four cents lower. So I don't think it's gonna go down by 100 equalized pupils, but that's the sort of the range. Um, so. The CLA's gonna impact it too. 
Yeah. Well, so and, and, right. So yeah. I didn't know if it, I, I was just like, what happens if it goes down by 100? And that was kind of where, it, it goes right back to kind of where it was last year. Mm -hmm. It won't go down by that much, but just as sort of a point of reference. Mm -hmm. um, I also have, these are sort of, sort of seemingly small things. When we were talking about the track process, we all agreed it was not perfect. But I wonder where there is room in this whole process for some of the sort of longer term priorities. I think of it in two categories as one is things that you buy, and one is time and energy investments. You know, educational sort of success and social emotional safety is sort of time and energy investment. It takes time to make those things happen. You don't throw money at that and have it be solved. There are things that break that need to be fixed, like roofs and things that came up and investments in more energy efficient things. And we didn't end up with a we never went back to the community and put and found our list of 10 things. And I wonder how we can sort of have an eye to some of these 10 year out things and have them in a priority list where we're thinking of like, this is number one. And I don't know what that looks like. Are you thinking in terms of facility projects? I'm not sure. That's what I'm saying. There's one that you spend money and you get a thing. And there's another one where you make, sh you make investments in positions and the results take time to come to fruition. And all of those things are, are important for us to keep our mind on because some folks were like, don't get a track. You have to make everybody be proficient at all their academics, and which none of which was going to happen. Um, and I don't know how to create, to, whether it's two categories or not, how far out that list goes, whether it's five years or 10 years, and how the district decides what the priorities are in those lists. But it might help us have a, and, I, and this goes into the values and the visions work, the vision work that we're doing. But these are sort of small things. What are the big visions that people have? Is there a place for that in the budget? The, these are our pie in the sky things, the things that get wiped right off the board on, on day one. You know, is there a place for those in the, in the budget that's, here's the pie in the sky stuff that we're not actually, that are not going into our budget, but does it help us think about where the roof fits in the next five to 10 years? I don't I know. The roof is the best example, because the roof fits in the capital plan. Like that's yeah. an answerable question. Um, that Andrew's thinking about. I would take like rewind budget presentations from the past four years or so, <clears throat> and for members who have been part of the board for the pa for a, a significant amount of time and have seen budget presentations, from probably our second one, we have had a focus. We knew that we needed to build our intervention system. Right? We knew that from my second budget. The first budget was really transportation and busing. Right. And the second budget was starting to build our capacity for an intervention system that actually worked. And every year for the past four years, we've added human capital to that effort. Um, and through the good work of um, Mike and our director of student services across the years, they've, they've collaborated to, to working on how to make that more effective. This year is probably the first year that we'll be able to point to information and evidence that the human resource capital investment that the board has agreed to over the past four years is paying off in term, is starting to pay off in terms of success for students, right? We couldn't put our beliefs around intervention in place until we had the people in place to do it, yeah. right? And that really didn't start to happen until last year. And this year with the last inter literacy interventionist at MSMS, I can't promise you'll never see another interventionist in a budget because um, MHS still only has one for reading and math. However, like we have the human capacity at UES now, for instance, at RVS, we have those positions in place. And we have, now we can talk about the system of like, let's collect evidence to see if what we're doing is working. 
Um, and so we've done so much work over that. So we have, like, we have seen that work. Now, in terms of five to 10 years down the, down the road and pie in the sky dreaming, we do do that work internally. It won't show up maybe here, um, but we did do that work together. And with a new leadership team, it was kind of clunky this year. <laughs> and, and we'll continue to get better at that as a team. And when we want to bring ideas forward, which you know the first budget meeting is not always the best time to do that. We should be talking about that prior to that. So looking at the visioning from the community, looking at where we want to move our schools, we are thinking that way. It's just not going to show up in a budget presentation, uh, you know. But there are there is evidence that things like that have right. Um, we could never have given you tier three data until this year. We just wouldn't have been able. If you had said, "Libby, tell me how the success of your tier three system," I couldn't have told you um, until this school year. So like building, that's a building and a change process that takes time, just like what you said, right? And our social emotional learning system is kind of following that same route, right? The idea of adding in two social emotional learning interventionists so that kids who are in the classroom and, and struggling in the classroom with behavior or executive functioning skills or any, you know, those kind of things, trying to find two professionals who are experts in that kind of skill level development um, for UES and MSMS in particular this year that's big, right? That's, that's, there aren't too many school districts who are thinking that way. So um, we, are, we are trying to boost certain areas that are based in our theory of growth up. Um, is it innovative? No, is it shiny pennies? Not at all, <laughs> because we have to get some evidence for moving kids forward first. Does that make sense? I, I understand the sentiment yeah. that Rhett is expressing around just sort of like, like tracking <laughs> the words that are coming out of my I think mouth, just sort of like sure tracking the feedback that we receive from the community too not just you know of course you're doing it with your with your awesome team internally but then also like is that reflective of the stuff that we're hearing from the community and I and I think kind of similar feedback to what you're giving which is like in the last couple of years the board and Libby have improved that type of information and data gathering a million fold it's yeah. like having all of those listening sessions. Um, when I look at this now, I feel like I can confidently say that it aligns with what we've heard from our community, which I don't think I was able to do the first time that I sat for a budget presentation, just because we weren't doing as much um, you know, polling and listening sessions and stuff of the community. Um, but how do we track all of that? Like We have some tracking devices that we've created with all the listening sessions but it could be more formalized. And I think that's part of the visioning work. Of, and then my other hope is that eventually we can circle back to people and say, we heard this from you, and now look, it's in the budget. You know, that type of thing, like circling back um, to promote the things that we're doing. I mean, a few years ago, I remember Libby talking about, a couple of years ago, I remember you talking about how we're one of the highest funded districts for social emotional learning you know, that we invest a lot of money in social emotional learning. And now on page 16, I'm seeing a further investment in social emotional learning. And I think that's um, really attributed to sort of what's, what you've learned about where students are at in the last couple of years and what, you know, and, and the values of our community and what we've heard from them. So I'm excited about this budget and I feel like I'm hoping that it can go a little further um, yeah. One thing that's just unrelated to what Rhett said, sorry, but I've also been active in the parents groups, mostly at the middle school and the high school, and we hear a lot of um, funding requests to the Boosters Club and stuff, and so some of those types of requests, I'm kind of like, why isn't this, why couldn't this be part of the budget? And some of them are, were mentioned um, tonight, too, as the thing. So, you know, I would appreciate not looking at it in terms of like how can we drop the tax rate year to year, you know, but you know, maybe increase a couple of cents here and there to make sure that the needs are met. That would be my hope. I know we want to wrap this up. Yeah. But I just wanted to say I, I'm not going to ask all the questions I sent over email because <laughs> some of them were already answered is one reason, and then others I can hold till later. But I, maybe it's more of a request, Libby, that um, the the slide eight, I think, is very helpful to show the connection. But I wonder if we could get even more concrete the next time you do a budget presentation. Not to say, like, oh, because 
Mike Berry is going to have more support. We'll be able to show X, Y, and Z data. Like, I don't want you to overpromise something that isn't doesn't make sense, but it might help as we're thinking about the impact that what our spending has on the outcomes that we're looking for. If we can see more of a connection between these are the goals that we set forth in our continuous improvement plan, for example, and here's how the um, the money that we're spending in a couple of areas will move us further toward those goals. Does that, does the question make sense? Yeah, I think it, it does that here, but I can talk to you more about yeah. how it doesn't do that or what, what's missing. Okay. We can talk more about that for the next presentation. Okay, thank you. Because I think the, the theme that I'm getting from this recent part of the conversation is like, we as a board, as being accountable to the community, need to be able to say, we think by spending this money, we're going to get the outcomes that we're looking for. And of course, you, that's what you're saying, but it will help me to see a little bit more of a through line. We're working towards the outcomes. Moving toward, yeah. moving yeah. toward those yeah. outcomes. Yeah. Moving toward those outcomes. Anyway. Yeah, no, a lot of those investments are in here, and particularly the social and emotional learning is very evident. Um, and I think kind of getting a peek at those visions, I think, is great work to do in the spring. Like, you know, what, mm -hmm. what you're thinking about and you know, which, which you've been doing and presenting some data, but I think we can continue that so when we enter the budget season, we're very aware. Um, so I think instructions is, you know, some figure of the great things we heard knowns, about. Yeah. yeah, figure out some more knowns, um, you know, put back in some of the great things we heard about tonight as good one-time expenses that I think we're all very supportive of. Um, and let's see what it looks like on the 21st. Can I ask one question of the board? This might, be a, this might be a bomb, but um, <laughs> if, the, say that. No. if the board were to see a percent increase, what would be an acceptable increase? How about this? I, 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 instead of giving you this, why don't you put in your needs and, and see where we're at? Okay. So it's like an increase on what? Though? Yeah. I, I don't know that I can say. And I, I really want to caution us. Like, there's this huge education fund surplus that we will not have next year, so the yeah. yield won't look as nice. And and, we'll and this 12% insurance increase is literally hitting every district statewide. So, like, overall, yeah. ed spending yeah. is up 9%, which means really we're, like, below level funding ed spending as a state because of this right. insurance. Like, there's... This is not just influential of Montpelier Roxbury, yeah, but right. everybody's budget influences everybody else's. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, be reasonable, but I, we, we had a very flawed system in the past where we used to just 5%, and I know. that was how the budget was made, so I, I don't want to go there. I, I, I know, I, was, I knew you were going to say that, because Grant, Grant used to and ask you that every year, and you say the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would just be interesting out of curiosity to know what the, what the if all of the, like, sort of, um, all, maybe not all of the items that were brought up tonight by the administrators, but the top two of, you know what I mean? Like okay. what, yeah, we'll, and even we'll if it was just like a quick that. number, like maybe it's not totally fleshed out um, in the presentation, but just sort of like a, here's the spectrum of what it could be, and now what's the appetite of the board and what we feel the appetite of the community is. Well, and I would want to, I would want to make sure that we capture the buildings and yeah. because if oh, he, did you see how fast he if, let me forget it if the fuel prices mean that we're not filling a custodial position for example that's a very direct impact that's not okay so I would want to know what mm -hmm. um, I would just like to see two or more races in the ethnicity demographics um, like my kids don't fit in any of these categories mm. And Even I feel from like from the agency of education, yeah. the data that's collected okay. there. Yeah, so. Mike, do you have anything about the demographics that's collected? Come forward so that you can speak in the mic. This is from the, the this slide, the demographic slide, yep. is from the agency of education data collection, correct? Correct. And we don't have much influence over that. But say, Sage, ask your question and then Mike can tell yeah, us if we can get that data. Oh, two or more. Yeah, yeah, we've we've provided feedback to the agency of education. Okay. Actually, I think Great. it's the federal government that dictates the agency of education which categories we use. So we've provided feedback often on that. We've heard that a, a couple times. Yeah. So we internally we don't have that data. Um, 
No, we, we are, because of the, the way SLDS works, that's where our data is, is put in, it's, it's one way. And it's, that dictates how our system captures the information. That's a good point. Thank you. Can people not choose to? Can't choose to. I didn't realize that because I was looking at some of these numbers and it was like, I, it was explained because it was the difference between the count on October 1st. And, but I was thinking that people could choose to. That would make sense. I, I would think. I don't know. I thought that you could. Policy monitoring. Policy monitoring. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Good night. Super helpful. Plus, you want to stick yeah. around for policy monitoring. Yes. Super exciting. Yeah, no, the uh, now they're really they're feedback like on the news is super helpful. Already. <laughs> they're ready to go. Bye, guys. That's See you tomorrow. Beautiful. Um, I move to approve the, or um, yeah, approve the policy monitoring reports for um, policy G14 and D6. Do you have a second? I second. Any discussion or questions? Oh. I do have a question. Yep. Um, so I see that Montpelier High School is 22.3 if you divide the students, the number of students by the number of teachers. But I'm wondering if you sort of like dug in the way that the policy is written is it's by uh, subject, by content area. And I'm wondering if you dug into those numbers and if you saw any red flags or anything there. Yeah, so it's, Montpelier High School is always a hard thing to do yeah. for class sizes because of the departments and the number of teachers and all of that kind of thing. If that we needed more FTE in certain content areas, you would have seen it in this budget. Mm -hmm. So we have about the same number of eighth graders as we do ninth graders, so those will be moving into ninth grade. Um, so Jason is confident that in the FTEs that we have available for um, next year. So, we, so in other words, to answer your question, according to Jason and in the in counseling services here, our FTE is adequate for the, te for the class sizes that we have here at Montpelier High School. And we're not like close to like dipping over yeah. in any of the, because I was hearing about larger class size, like 26 and stuff like that. But is that not typical? That is not typical. Okay. And then I had a question just about in general, because we talk about, we've talked about this policy and policy committee and in the English composition in the policy, it's, you know, there's, in all the other areas, there's more of a broad, like, sort of scale of, like, minimum of 18 and high, you know, maximum of 25. But in English composition, it's minimum of 18 students, optimum of 20, maximum of 20, which is a two-student range. I'm just wondering what you think about that to give more thought to it. Um, I'm not sure why we don't have a class called English Composition, so I'm, there's several questions I have about okay. that particular one. Yeah. When, the, um, when the policy committee is ready to take a look at that, then we'll get our high school folks who are much more well-versed in this area and what we actually yeah. offer yeah. in the room with you to, uh -huh. to have conversations about this. Great, thank you. I think that actually came up last year a couple, other, a couple yeah. of years ago, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's what that's, that was. Yeah, yeah, I've heard it. I've heard it. I've heard it. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm also glad to see just in the, the budget with the reduction in force that we would only be we wouldn't be anywhere near the maximum in that grade level. Um, it would still be like optimal size. Yeah. So that was really nice to see. Uh, other questions or comments about. Um, G14 and DO6. Do I have yeas? We, have, we already have a motion. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you. Um, policy reading. We have a second policy reading of the F2 Dodd discriminatory mascots and school branding. Um, and then just a note that, you know, thank you everyone for the input last week, although I wasn't here, and we got some by email uh, on 8.23.24. We're going to discuss that on the 21st, I believe. Um, but any comments or questions on 
the non-discriminatory mascot and school branding and policy and anything that needs noting or change? No. Great. Um, second reading noted and we'll pass it along for third and final reading next meeting. Um, Anna very kindly put the motion that we need to enter executive session for the purpose of appointing a board member. Does anyone want to make that motion? And it's right there, right there for the, the <laughs> I reading. I we enter executive session for the purpose of discussing new board member applicants <laughs> because doing so in public session will clearly place the applicants at a substantial disadvantage. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.